Well, good morning, boys and girls. Today is February 7th, 2021, and the Super Bowl will be played tonight. I'm excited that you're with us today here at Ford Road Bible Chapel watching on Zoom. And those of you watching on YouTube later, thank you for watching. My goal in prayer is that we can consider today things that will cause you to think, wonder, explore more, understand, and grow in God's Word. I will start by stating that my earlier comment about the Super Bowl will be the only reference to football beyond this simple go bucks. So boys and girls, I have a question for you. Did you know the fruit of the spirit is not a coconut? No, it's love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And another question, does the wise man build his house on the sand? No. The wise man builds his house on the rock. Unless you think I'm supposed to be teaching Sunday school today and you're in the wrong Zoom, I wanted to illustrate a thought before we start to discuss our scripture of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And that is, these two very important truths, the fruit of the Spirit, and building your foundation on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, among other lessons that we teach to our children that will serve them as they grow in the Lord, are the same truths that Paul is bringing to the attention of the there are not two Gospels, one for adults or the educated, and one for children or simpler minds. In fact, there is no part of the Gospel that we are authorized to keep back from teaching to anyone. It is all right here in the Bible, God's holy word, available for all to read and study and meditate on. However, it is important to know, we discuss, read, teach, and understand scripture is often based on our spiritual condition and the condition of the audience. The believer that has walked with the Lord for 10, 20, 30, even 50 plus years will read and understand and interpret scripture differently than the new or young Christian. Paul starts out his very strong letter telling the reader that he is speaking to them as babes. Some would say it is because they are acting like whining little children, I suggest to you it is more because he wanted to grab their attention clearly and in a way it would quickly show they did not know what they did not know. Just like a Sunday school teacher would probably not dive their kindergarten class into Romans 13 in a debate on whether a Christian should submit to government, Paul takes a few lines to explain why it is important to grow spiritually. Open with me in your Bibles to our chapter in 1 Corinthians 3. We'll open in prayer, and then I'll read the first four verses. And as we go through this time, we will look back in each section. We're about to discuss it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for these words that you thank you for the time preparing this message. Help us today to hear with open hearts and minds what each of us needs, that we may become spiritual men and women whose focus is on Christ. And his desire is to live and work for you, for your greater praise and glory. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Preparing for this message, I spent time in various resources. It was interesting to me that the majority of commentary and focus of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is spent in the first four verses. It is an important discussion to look at what Paul is talking about with the carnal man and how that is understood and intended. Paul considered this of utmost importance for them to understand. So we're going to begin by gaining some understanding of the concept before we talk about the overarching topic. There are three categories of people described between 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and chapter 3, verse 4. And as I'm describing these three categories, there will be a lot of scripture references given fairly quickly to show where it can be found in supporting scripture. Feel free to jot down the references or contact me if you want a list of those references. These three categories are natural, carnal, and spiritual. 
What is a carnal Christian and where does a carnal person fall between the natural and the spiritual is the question. And how are we to understand the differences in these three? Well, let's go back one chapter to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And Paul calls the unsaved person natural. A person without the spirit of God. We're going to start with the natural person. The natural person is an unbeliever. He is without Christ and without the Holy Spirit. He is committed to having the self-reliant flesh or the old person foremost in his life. And he is dominated by the works of the flesh. As it says in Galatians 5, 19, 20, he sees spiritual things as foolish and will not receive them, receive them as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. He is spiritually dead from Ephesians 2, 5, and he's blind as described in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, enslaved to sin as is detailed in Romans 6.20. We move to the carnal Christian. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4 that we just read, Paul says that the Corinthians are carnal. In other translations, is written as worldly or fleshly or of the flesh. The Greek word that he used was sarkikos. It's used here in this passage meaning characterized by the flesh. It speaks of the one who can and should do differently but does not. Paul says that the Corinthians were sarkikos, characterized. The Holy Spirit has opened the heart of the Christian to receive the word of the Lord. That is shown to us in the story of Lydia in Acts 16, 14. The scripture says one of those listening to Paul was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. It specifically says that the Lord opened her heart to respond. God has effectually called the person. We know people are called because of 1 Corinthians 124 and drawn because of John 644. The Holy Spirit has crucified the flesh as stated in Galatians 524 and put the old self to death as we see in Romans 6. Their old nature has been initially struck down in Christ, begun to be elevated in place of themselves. Therefore, this is the point. The carnal Christian has decisively turned to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and has sincerely renounced the path of disobedience as is required from Romans 10, 9, Acts 3, 19, and Acts 16, 31. This person deeply acknowledges Christ as Lord of their life and does not renounce him in their heart. However, this person has begun, but only begun, to fight the sin in their life. Romans 8, 13, we read, The corruption of the flesh and the influence of the world is still strong, and a battle is underway. The battle is not fully won because their faith is weak. and The means of grace are not yet in full use. God has begun the transformation of the remaining corruption, showing the depths of our depravity. But the carnal person suffers in varying degrees because they resist the fight against God's omnipotent power. As humans, coming from our sin nature, we tend to be obstinate and uncooperative toward authority or discipline. It varies for each believer how fast or slow our process, our very transformation is. It can be very slow for some when they don't allow God to reign, but instead stay mired in their fleshly desires or worldliness. The carnal Christian is saved, but is not yet at the point at which to be called spiritual. This is why Paul calls them babes. When a baby is born, there is much rejoicing, just like when a man commits his life to Christ. As the baby grows and develops, they start to eat solid food allowing more growth that will be needed for the body to support them in their physical life journey. When the new Christian begins to understand what faith is, the sacrificial work of Jesus that their foundation is built upon and how the fruits of the Spirit can be exhibited in their life, it allows growth which will support them in their spiritual life journey. This is a time of rejoicing, but not the end of learning or maturing. Finally, the spiritual Christian. The person that abides with the Spirit of God is spiritual. The difference between the spiritual Christian and the carnal Christian is one of degrees. Becoming a spiritual or mature is a gradual 
process in which Christ subdues more and more of our remaining corruption, and we become more and more in tune with the Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit pervades more and more of our lives, and the old sins lose more and more of their hold. This comes to pass as we trust Christ more and more fully as the all-satisfying friend and guide of our daily lives. Paul describes spiritual people as Christians who understand and believe in spiritual things with the help of God's Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13. So as we go back to verse 1, Paul begins by confronting their condition of carnality. Paul is building on something he said in the previous chapter. First, he wrote that he and others taught God's wisdom among the mature, apparently referring to those who have come to God by faith in Christ and are ready for the deeper truths of God in 1 Corinthians 2.6. The Corinthians, and as Paul says, all who this letter is addressed to are part of the family of God. He calls the reader brethren. Though they have the Holy Spirit, unlike the natural person of 1 Corinthians 2, of 1 Corinthians 2 14 that we talked about, they are not behaving like spiritual people, but like carnal, that is, fleshly people, like immature Christians, babies in Christ, needing constant care and correction. Now, among some, there is a significant debate as if there can be such a thing as a carnal Christian. Some say there's a contradiction in terms that. Paul is really saying that these carnal ones are not Christians at all, yet he clearly calls them brethren and says they are babies in Christ. How could these terms be used for someone who is not a Christian? There is no doubt that this letter is to those who profess to be saved in Christ. Paul very clearly wrote in the first chapter, thankful he was that their faith had been confirmed by the gifts of the Spirit given to them. From 1 Corinthians 1, 4-9. He said they would absolutely stand blameless before God on the day of the Lord. These are Christians. The challenge is that these Christians, to some extent, are thinking and acting according to the flesh, not the spirit, of, of course. The flesh does not dominate every aspect of their life, or they would then have no evidence of being born again. But Paul is addressing issues where they clearly are thinking and acting in a carnal, worldly, or fleshly manner. They are looking at and focusing on the obvious present world in front of them, rather than seeking the eternal perspective that Christ opened up to us through his sacrifice and death on the cross and God's word, which shows us his character and example of how to live the pleasing. But remember, as I said, the Holy Spirit has opened the heart of the carnal Christian to receive the word of the Lord. Alan Redpath was a British evangelist pastor and author from the 20th century. He was a pastor at Moody Church in Chicago in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And he also received an honorary doctrine of divinity from Houghton College. It was interesting to me as I graduated from Houghton in the 90s. He simply wrote it this way. The carnal Christian is a child of God, born again, on his way to heaven. But he is traveling third class because he is still mastered by the flesh. While we are working to master our flesh, life is made up of various victories and defeats. As we walk with God, as we take a place of lowliness and humility before God, feed upon the word, as we pray, our spiritual life is developed, and we grow in grace and knowledge of God. But if we are lazy in taking advantage of the means of grace, we may find that even after years of being saved, we are far from having the kind of a Christian life that the Lord desires for us to fully embrace and experience. So Paul has spoken about three categories of people, the natural man who is patterned after Adam and rejects the things of the spirit, the spiritual man who knows the things of God, and the carnal man who knows the things of God, and yet in some significant way is still characterized by the flesh. Paul is not asking them which one they are. He has identified them very specifically. Knowing why Paul is addressing them as carnal, how does he treat these believers? He feeds them. In 1 Corinthians 3.2, he says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. He fed them. 
He fed them with what they could handle. Paul keeps his teachings on the basics, even though they had an inflated view of their spirituality. <clears throat> Understanding the Corinthian culture at the time, Tom, a few weeks ago, set the scene for us. One of Aristotle, science, technology, a world of education and ever-changing social values, political debate, debate, and endless games. One that wanted everything new all the time. The Hellenistic culture valued youth, innovation, and action over contemplation. The Corinthian believers believed they were ready for the deeper things, but were not living any deeper in the basic things he had already preached to them. The difference between milk and solid food degrees. A progression in capacity and ability. Both are nourishing, but for different stages in life. You have to be ready before you move to the next stage, only after fully mastering the first. So being a father and watching my children develop, I thought of this analogy. A banana is considered solid food, and so is a lobster. Yet there's a big difference between who is willing and when you're able to eat them. Bananas are one of the first solid foods we feel to feed to children as they can easily be digested. They even can be fed to themselves early because of their soft texture without the hazard of choking. While a lobster is a solid food, it's much more difficult to chew and even get to if it's in its whole form. A complex process to get to the food inside the shell, to know which parts to eat and not to eat. Both are solid food, but even though the young child may be intrigued by the shape and bright red shell of a cooked lobster, it can't handle what's inside. It takes time and maturity to understand. Every doctrine that can be taught or preached can be taught to children, though not in the same words. As I said in the beginning, there are not two gospels, one for the educated and one for the simple. There is one gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his saving power, but it takes focus, intentionality, and wisdom from the Holy Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth. We walk and live in that power. Why is Paul saying you are not able to receive it? It wasn't that God was preventing the Corinthians from receiving the solid, the solid food. The real problem was the Corinthian attraction to spiritual junk food based on man's worldly wisdom and eloquence. They were so filled with this junk food, this mixture of worldly views and heavenly views, that they were not able to receive the pure spiritual food. Christ is all. Paul wanted to give this to them. Now, as Tom pointed out several weeks ago in their defense, most of the New Testament hadn't been written when Paul was writing to them. So they didn't have the full scripture to answer their questions. However, we also know they had access to Paul himself to answer their questions. They had, in fact, written to him, hence where the letters to the Corinthians came from. We, Christians who have God's word at our fingertips, are not able to claim the same caveat of limited resources. Even today, some spiritual junk food Christians are greatly blessed when they get a spiritual meal of solid food, one of truth not mixed with the world's perspective on what truth is. But others, when presented with solid food, are not able to receive it because their spiritual taste buds are so conditioned to listening to the world's perspective of spirituality that their messages are mixed and not focused on the pure word of God. That is all they have interest in or a taste for and they are unwilling to try new things, even though it would benefit them in a far greater way. So what is the evidence of carnality? Well, we read that in verses three and four. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? If we want to learn from scripture, to avoid being characterized by the flesh, like Paul says of the Corinthian believers, we should do the opposite of what they're being called out on. What is the opposite of envy, strife, and divisions? It's love and unity, being of one mind of Christ. Here Paul reminds them about something he's already talked about in chapter 1, like I feel I do with my children. Sometimes Paul repeats things over and over and over again to make sure that the message and lesson is clear. Matt Gorman spoke about this two weeks ago regarding prideful divisions. Paul appealed to the Corinthians in chapter 1, giving them the command to agree with one another, not to take sides. Focus on Christ, his work on the cross, and the baptism in Jesus' name, 
not that of Paul or any other. Later in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul will write in great detail about love, what it is and what it isn't. He says clearly, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. All things that will be prevalent in their society then, and our society today, which focus on self-exaltation and worldly accolades, not honoring and trusting God above all others. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? Are they not showing the values of the world and themselves overvaluing being of one mind with Christ? We heard about last week in chapter 2. Again, this bears repeating. In Colossians 3.11, that we read, Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. The Corinthian Christians thought of themselves as spiritual, but their divisions show that they are, in fact, fleshly. The problems they had in their human relationships show them there was something wrong in their relationship with God. It was evidence of carnality, of a fleshly way of thinking and living, which Paul felt important to address repeatedly to the Corinthians at the time. Paul says they're behaving like mere men. Paul did not say they were mere men. That is to say that they were the natural man or not saved, only that they were behaving like mere men. Christians have a higher call than living like the rest of humanity. If you are claiming to be a spiritual people, you are saying, I am walking in the spirit. If you do otherwise, then you are being worldly and are called upon to stop behaving that way. Remaining worldly is not one of the options that God has called us to. We are called to walk worthy. In Ephesians 4, Paul beseeches the Ephesians to walk worthy of the calling, which you are called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and binding of the peace. Our actions should match our words and our outward presentation match our inward convictions. To live in such a way as to honor God as we complete his plan for us. When one says, I am a Paul, are you not carnal? We might have thought that Paul would be more kind to his own fan club. But instead of letting their praises stroke his flesh, Paul denounced even his own partisans. There is not a party or a person here on earth to which we should be claiming resolute allegiance. In verses 5 and 7, Paul addresses the foolishness of exalting her leaders. As Paul points out, even to those who claim an alliance to him, he gives us instructions on how to regard leaders in the church. He asks, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. He wants to make very clear, Paul and Apollos are not the ones they believed on for salvation. They only brought the good news of Jesus to them. They are through whom they believed, not on whom they believed, only as the Lord determined. Again, going back to chapter 1, there were leaders the Corinthians were claiming to follow. Paul, Cephas, or Peter, Christ, and Apollos. Here in chapter 3, he mentions it again. Likely, they were rejecting the other Christian teachers in misguided loyalty to the one that they preferred. Paul wants them to move past any idea that he and Apollos are in competition with each other. He describes both as servants of the Lord, who helped the Corinthians to come to faith in Christ. Apollos was a fellow laborer. We find Apollos described in Acts 18, 24, and 28. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great favor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, he, the brothers and sisters, encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, providing from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Apollos traveled through Acacia and eventually found his way to Corinth. We read in Acts 19.1 where he watered where Paul had sown. 
Apollos, with his natural gifts, had attracted a following among the church in Corinth. But simple admiration was growing into divisiveness. Against Apollos' wishes, there was a fraction in Corinth who claimed him as their spiritual mentor. Paul corrects this misguided loyalty when he writes, I planted Apollos' water, but God gave the increase. Then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. The last mention of Apollos in the Bible comes in Paul's letter to Titus in chapter 3. Paul writes, do everything you can to help Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Obviously, Paul still considered Apollos to be a valuable co-laborer and a friend. And as we will study in chapter 12, there is one body, two hands, two feet, one head. As parts of the body of Christ, Christian workers have different jobs and see different results. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So that there should be no division in the body, but that is parts should have an equal concern for each other. One part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. In verses 8 and 9, Paul moves on to two metaphors. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. When a farmer plants a seed and waters it, he really does not make it grow. The natural process that God set forth makes it grow. All the farmer can do is provide the right environment for growth and trust in God's natural process. We do the same thing when ministering to other people in Jesus' name. We plant the seed or water the seed, but the growth belongs to God. God is the one who gets the work done. God. God gives the increase. Some people are frustrated because they want to water when God has called them to plant. They want to plant when God has called them to water. Others are frustrated because they want to make the increase happen or are frustrated that the increase did not happen. Only God can do that. Real fruitfulness in ministry happens when we are peacefully content with what God has called each one of us to do, understanding we are unified in the work of Christ. He who plants and he who waters are one. In combating the Corinthian desire to divide among leaders, Paul reminds them they are all on the same team. The fact is, planters and waters are both necessary. Both need each other, and both are working towards the same goal, a fruitful harvest. Christian workers work together, but are rewarded according to their own labor. Each one will receive his own reward. Ideally, all work together, but each is rewarded individually. Reward is not given according to their outward success, but according to their own labor. God knows how to reward properly. A spiritual Christian will not be keeping a ledger on his due or what he has done. Charles Hodge, an 18th century revolutionary war doctor and theologian said, the faithful laborer, laborous minister or missionary who labors in obscurity and without apparent fruit will meet a reward far beyond that of those who with less self-denial and effort are made the instruments of great results. We are God's fellow workers. God has given us this amazing opportunity to work with him. We cannot work without him. And when you consider all the ways God could have done his work, it's even more amazing to know he wants our participation. Paul points this out by calling the Corinthians God's field. You are God's field. You are God's building. The work Paul did with God was to work on God's people. They were his field, using the picture of a farmer planting and watering. And they were his building, using the picture of a builder. Nehemiah chapter 3 is all about work, about rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. Individuals pitched in and did the work together, coordinated and led by Nehemiah. It shows the need for believers to work together to accomplish something. It pleased God to see his people working together in one accord, with one heart, with one mind. God will put us in situations where we must work together and learn how to lead, how to follow how to work together with one heart and one mind. The prophet Nehemiah encourages us to build side by side. No one is working alone. 
We're all built something, something bigger than ourselves. In verses 10 through 15, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But each one heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. In describing Paul's work among the Corinthians, he begins with a declaration of grace, according to the grace of God. He knew that his status as a worker in God's field or on God's building was based on God's undeserved favor, not on his own deserving or merit. Entitlement is a big buzzword these days. Christians, we know the opposite. Because of our sin, we are not entitled to get the salvation we received. It was a gift. Understanding the gift is paramount to understanding that it is our privilege to be a fellow worker with God. God doesn't choose exalted people to do his work. It isn't anything in them that makes them worthy to be his worker beyond the humility to accept it by and according to the grace of God that we have the opportunity to work. When Paul founded the church in Corinth in Acts 18, he set the only foundation that can be laid the person and work of Jesus Christ. Yet he knew that others would come after him and build on the foundation he set. There is only one foundation for the church. If the church isn't founded on Jesus Christ, it isn't a church at all. Paul warns that while Jesus is the only true church foundation, we need to be careful how we continue the work, lest we unworthily and dam damage the integrity of the building. We'll test the building work of all. Each one's work will be made obvious by the testing. Some will build with precious things that hold up and are even refined by fire, like gold and silver and precious stone. Others will build with unworthy materials that are consumed by fire, like wood, hay, and straw. By using the imagery of gold, silver, and precious stones, Paul uses items that retain value that can be used to grow wealth or be handed down through generations. Paul could be referencing the materials that Solomon used building the earthly temple in 1 Chronicles. But the building God is constructing in the New Testament and today, people. Paul will go on to say we are his temple, both as the church and as individuals. And his church will remain through generations, through wars, through hard times. It has everlasting value. Precious stones do not mean jewels, but fine stone materials like marble and granite. And mixing the wisdom of men with the wisdom of God in the work of building the church is like using alternate layers of straw and marble in a building. Straw may be fine. It may have a place in a barn, but is in an inadequate building material. In the same way, human wisdom or popular thought may have a place in life, but not in the building of the church. The fire will test each one's work. The amount of the work isn't going to be evaluated when our work is tested by God. It will be revealed what kind or sort it was. Just as fire will destroy wood, hay, and straw, but not gold, silver, and precious stones, so the work of some will be revealed as nothing on the day of judgment. His work will be burned and will vanish in eternity. I came across this quote from D.L. Moody, where he said that converts ought to be weighed as well as counted, meaning the quality of the Christian is important. Winning converts is not the only goal. Growing maturity in believers is important as well. This is a difficult and sobering thought. There are many people who believe they are serving God, but are doing it in an unworthy manner or with an unworthy materials. I ask you, what is your intention? What is your heart's desire and attitude in the work that you are doing? Are you doing your work as unto the Lord or out of obligation or looking for worldly recognition? Paul is telling us they will come to find in eternity that they have, in reality, done nothing for the Lord. While our salvation is secure, if we truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our gift, 
our crown for the Lord may not be as much as we want to offer, and our life on earth will have been wasted if we receive no crown to give Jesus for his glory. We see the picture of giving crowns in Revelation. In chapter 4, 10, and 11, when the four and twenty elders fell down before him, that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. For thy pleasure they are and were created. In reading through this passage, I see an initial application to Christian leaders. Paul is directing this to elders and deacons and teachers in Corinth. However, the application really extends to all who are claiming to be in the service of God. Remember the part about being God's building? Well, now we're at that part where Paul talks about being the temple of God. Verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Paul will later in chapter 6 speak of individual Christians being temples. In chapter 3, he, his emphasis on the church as a whole, though like many other teaching points, it has application to individuals. When Paul calls the church a temple, don't think he is using a picture. The physical temple was the picture. God's dwelling in us is the reality. What makes the church a temple? The Spirit of God dwells in it. Paul is calling the local assembly to be the sanctuary of God where God dwells. There is his sanctuary. Paul's question is intended to startle and impress on the reader a sacred characteristic of the assembly. The idea of a temple brings majesty, purity, light, worship. And when summoned to assemble, the Corinthians should find themselves in the presence of God. If anyone defiles the temple of God, if you defile the church, God will destroy you. God's temple, his church, is holy, and it matters to God how we treat his holy temple. How then do we glorify God? We glorify him by pursuing real wisdom. Verses 18 through 20 in our chapter. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. If anyone among you seems to be wise. Paul is being a little sarcastic here, of course. The Corinthians consider themselves wise in this age. This was the age of wisdom, time of enlightenment. That was one of their foundational problems, their love of worldly wisdom. What is one to do if they consider themselves wise in this age? If they are wise according to a human measure of wisdom, they are to become a fool. He may become wise. Let's pause on this for a minute. This is not double talk. This could be its own study. I look to see who or where fools were addressed. We find in Psalms 14, we read, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And in Proverbs 14, fools make a mock at sin. And in Luke 12, Jesus uses the parable of the rich fool to give advice. Paul says, become a fool that you may become wise. Paul is taking the mirror image and saying, be the opposite. Look to God, do not mock sin. Take it seriously and address it. And be prepared. If the thing that is preventing you from fully embracing God is human wisdom, stop being humanly wise and look for God's wisdom, God's heart, the mind of Christ. Don't confuse worldly wisdom with knowledge. Knowledge is perfectly good. Gain as much as you can. But the wisdom that is the philosophy, the reasoning of this world, that is foolishness with God. Paul asks them to renounce all worldly wisdom, all humanism man-centered philosophies, even if it means being called a fool. If one is not willing to be considered a fool by those who value only human wisdom, then man will never be able to truly become wise. God has evaluated the wisdom of this world as he considers it foolishness. It is crafty, it contorts, and it creates sympathies. And it's futile, no matter how we justify it to make the world a better place. And it is good to work on earth to bring people love and peace as long as we have the wisdom to bring God's peace. So I ask, are you wise enough to agree with God's evaluation of the wisdom of the world foolishness?
As we come to the last three verses, Paul says in verse 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And as always, when we see a therefore, we must ask ourselves, what is the therefore, therefore? Looking back and summarizing throughout this chapter, Paul has made a compelling argument for maturity in our spirituality. He points in verse 4 to the underlying problem that the Corinthians were claiming allegiance to himself, or Apollos, glorifying men, not the God they serve. He addresses planting and watering, and how our rewards for diligent, faithful work are required by all of us, even though it is God who gives the increase. Paul details to us how our work will be tested by fire and implores us to build worthily on the foundation laid by Jesus Christ. Glorify God by seeing his servants in the right perspective as servants and co-laborers. And if we grab hold of this and reach for spiritual wisdom, then all things are yours. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. How prone we are to a glory in men. We are more excited about being with or looking like the influential and famous of this world than about being with or looking like Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. It is easy to value the gifts and honors of men more than the gifts and honors of God. How we need to hear, let no one glory in men. For all things are yours. To say we are Paul or of Apollos is to have a view that is too narrow. Each and every gift is for the saints. As one teacher does not carry all the truth of God, all are necessary for the enrichment of the saints to accomplish the work. Do not be too constricted. Paul and Apollos and Cephas belong to you. The whole universe is yours. In Christ, the world is ours, not only referring to the enjoyment of things, but the promise that we shall exercise authority over it. Life is ours to be entered into fully as an opportunity to live and witness for Christ. Death is ours. Christ has vanquished it, and we have victory in the presence of Christ and things to come. Our brother John Peaslin, not knowing that my message was about this this week, posted this quote from Charles Spurgeon on Tuesday. I'll close with this, and be encouraged, brethren. You are his by donation, for the Father gave you to the Son, his by his bloody purchase, for he counted down the price for your redemption, his by dedication, for you have consecrated yourself to him, his by relation for you are named by his name, and made one of his brethren and joint heirs. Be thou ever one of those whose manners are Christian, whose speech is like the Nazarene, whose conduct and conversation are so redolent of heaven that all who see you may know that you are the Savior's, recognizing in you his features of love and his countenance of holiness. I am a Roman, was of old a reason for integrity, far more than let it be your argument for holiness. I am Christ, Charles Spurgeon. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Let's close in prayer, and thank you for listening. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your amazing plan of salvation. Thank you that your dearly loved son laid aside his glory to become a man so that he could give up his sinless life and bring many sons to glory by faith in him. How thankful we are that you have forgiven us for the times we have fallen into the trap of carnality, worldly thinking. I pray that may we, keep, we may keep our eyes, our consciousness upon the Lord Jesus and keep from allowing the mindset of the world to infiltrate our hearts and our effective worth, witness to others. I pray that we all may develop spiritual wisdom before you and be equipped to forward the good news of the gospel of Christ in a mature manner that does not engage in unnecessary squabbling, petty differences, but, but to be unified, that we will be ready to give an instructive answer to the hope found in Christ. That you, that Jesus is the rock of the salvation and the foundation stone upon which my faith is founded, Lord, keep us looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for listening and have a great day.